Uh, just got a notification that said we're live. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> it, it takes uh, sometimes YouTube uh, says one thing and means another. <laughs> cool. Uh, give me just a second. I bet you we're live now. Um, well, so welcome. Hopefully, yeah. uh, everybody's uh, up early and happy this morning. Yeah, the boys just got up. We had we had twin boys. I don't know if I you knew that since we talked to you. No, about. I didn't. My yeah. gosh, they're a year and a half old. Uh, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I saw a, a picture. I didn't know if, that they were twins, so. Yeah. Yeah, they uh, they were born in June, so and it's a lot of fun, a lot of, lot of work, but like them a lot. Yeah. They'll, pro cool. they'll, they'll, pro they'll probably make an audio appearance banging on the, the garage door at some point. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have your ladder. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that ladder is, like, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, um, the uh, uh, it's it like extends and all this, and my wife likes using it. <laughs> yeah, what's really nice is you can make one leg shorter than the the other one, so you can get really close to the the house or something. Yep, and stairs and stuff. I mean, they're they're really. Uh, we had to get one because we painted our house in Iowa by ourselves. Um, that was kind of a pain in the butt, but. Um, got it painted and sold it. Yeah, we just got a new roof not too long ago and had to, uh, or got new gutters too. And uh, behind the gutters wasn't painted, so I had to paint all that stuff. So yeah, what a mad dash! Awesome. Um, well, so where do you make your knives? Right here in the garage is where I uh, grind them and uh. I do some of the glue up and stuff down in the basement. I have a, a Rockwell hardness tester. And oh, wow. What 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 did you end up getting? It's a it's a Wilson. Um, it's a it's a really old one. Uh, oh. Was one of the one of the better uh, better things I stumbled across. So uh, one of the I'm I'm an engineer and uh, one of the metallurgists that. Uh, I work with his dad was also a metallurgist and he bought a whole bunch of this metallurgy stuff, Rockwell hardness testers and, um, different, uh, different, uh, microscopes and things. And he, uh, planned that once he retired, he would open his own consulting, uh, shop. Well, turns out he said when he, when he got older that, uh, he, uh, didn't have as much energy as he thought he would have when he was buying all this stuff when he was 30 and 40 years old. So he sold it to me for $150. Oh my God. <laughs> and pretty much all I had to do to it was uh, clean it up for about two hours, had a bunch of dust and stuff on it. Yeah. So. Mine came from China, <laughs> but it's <laughs> he, very accurate. He also it's sold like, me this it, big uh, granite surface plate I have next to me that's uh, 18 inches by 24 inches by four inches. Uh, and it weighs about 200 pounds uh, for 30 bucks. He's like, Granite? I want it out of here. <laughs> you know what you can use that for? I, Making like, fudge. What? Big slab of granite like that. Uh, all the candy shops up here have, when they, they get their fudge out of the ah. the vat, they dump it onto there because it cools it off really quickly and stuff. Yeah, this one's a certified flat one uh, like they use for um, machine shops and stuff. So I use it for laying out scribe lines and different things like that. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'd like to have one of those. That, make sure the edge is in the center of the blade since I use such thin steel. Nice. What are you using for a grinder now? I have a grinder in a box. I can actually uh, take you off here. And, uh, yeah, show us. A, give us a little tour here. Oh, so, you're using 2 by 72 then. Yeah. So I've got... Uh, Let's see here. Oh, yeah. Ethan Becker's got one just like that. Yeah. So I uh, I kind of did some of the modifications. I added a little light up here that uh, makes it super handy to, uh, with the, the flat platen. And I uh, just built a disc sander also. Oh, nice. That, uh, I love using. That'd be handy. What? Uh, so you use that for like surface grinding and stuff? I use it for getting the bevels flat on my, my kitchen knives because I can get almost all the blade on there at one time. Oh, okay. And one of the really handy things is this guy makes these uh, 
plates, so there's magnets on there, so you can take the take the plate on and off. So you, if the sandpaper is not all used up, you can swap in between grits and then the goes right back on. Right, right. Oh, that's nice. That's clever. Yeah. Yeah. I um, I have to freehand my stuff, <laughs> and yeah. it, it it usually ends up pretty damn good, but uh, it's. It took a long time to learn how to do that. I use that thing that's a bubble jig. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I, for whatever reason, I've tried using like actual jigs and all that, and it always screws up. So I just gave up on it. Um, I mean, or, uh, when I do my initial grinds, I mainly just use a work rest. And uh, mm -hmm. let me grab that real quick. So, uh, it's oh, a guy yeah. on uh, Instagram, and he has a got a uh, eBay store, DD Workrest, and he makes this uh, multi-position one. Uh, this is the extreme tilt version that he does, uh, so it can tilt tilt really far up this way. Okay, and, uh, that's what I that's what I mainly use, and just uh, use a push stick, and so I don't oh. hold my fingers as much. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Uh, and then you just change the angle of that depending on what angle you're trying to grind to? Well, the angle that's on there is what I put for my uh, the start of my bolsters or the start of my handles. Uh, so that's okay. The right I see. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so when I'm grinding my blades, I just have it perpendicular to the, the platen. I don't use it to set the angle. Okay. I see. Well, that's cool. Um, I saw that you had some file work on the back there. Show yeah. that again, would you? Yeah. The, well, so this is, I don't know how well you're going to be able to. Oh, yeah. Did TM Hunt does something like that? Yeah, he was actually the one that taught me how to, how to do yeah. the thorn style. And then uh, I've kind of branched off with some, some different patterns. Uh, this is one oh, I call Oh, that's box. really Yeah, that's cool. And, and then how are you filling in the... Uh, is that just epoxy that you're filling in on the top there? Yeah. Yeah, I use epoxy with uh, some black pigment. And there's uh, one I call bubbles. I really like that pattern quite a bit. That's cool. Yeah, I could actually I could actually use some instruction in that. <laughs> I, I don't usually add that sort of thing to my knives, but it does add a nice visual touch. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't really take a, a, a whole it's not it's not extremely hard. It just takes a long time. Uh -huh. um, I used to um, use how Todd taught me was with uh, chainsaw file. Yeah, round files. yeah, that's that's what he and, showed uh, me too. I upgraded to uh, a Fordham tool, which is basically like a Dremel on steroids. So it has a big, uh, big electric motor with a metal flex shaft, and then to a smaller handpiece. You might let's might see that. Let's see in the medical industry. Yeah, it, let's see this. Do you, can you show us that? Yeah, let me take you back down here. So, uh, this is it up in the. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, those are uh, in in medicine. Ours are all pneumatic powered. Okay. So it plugs okay. into a nitrogen source, but yeah, yeah. So the, oh, that's nice. Where do you so, get the bits for all of that? Uh, I mainly get them from McMaster Car. McMaster uh, Car. Okay. Yeah, they're uh. They're an industrial supply place. It's a really big. Uh, they have tons of uh, uh, things. It's it's a uh, it's a little scary for me because uh, I work literally like five minutes away from their world headquarters. So if it says on stock in stock on their website, I can get it in about thirty minutes. <laughs> nice. Yeah, <laughs> so that's I end cool. Up, end up buying quite a bit of stuff, different uh, different uh, burrs and. Uh, drill bits and everything much better than anything you can get at like Home Depot or Ace or whatever. How are you keeping the dust down in there? You have a very clean shop. You should see mine. It's a disaster. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, I uh, blow it out with a leaf blower. But, okay. Uh, um, so I've got uh, a big, or a, I think it's a one, one horsepower mm -hmm. wall unit. And then mm -hmm. I have a dust right uh, filter. So it's, uh, I think it's three micron or five micron uh, paper filter to a bag. But mm -hmm. what catches most of the dust is this uh, big uh, uh, cyclone 
system here. It's made by Onita. Okay. Uh, so that collects, coll spins and collects most of the dust. Okay. Am I getting a, oh, that's better. Yeah. Oh, and then, and then you just put that hose up to wherever you're working. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, this is the one that I mainly use for handles. Um, I use just a bucket with water uh, when, uh, when I'm doing metal. Um, yeah. Okay. So this. Oh, I see. I so take, yeah. So I you take off the side so it gets a little more suction right underneath it, and you can move this up and down depending on if I'm using the small wheel attachment or the flat platen or whatever. And all of, all of that's available uh, commercially. Then all of that yeah. system. Yeah. Uh, this thing down here is uh, was actually for like wood turners on lakes. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, they can put it next to where where they're where they're going. And then, yeah. yeah, all the tubing and stuff is pretty much I bought from either Rockler or woodworking or uh, Woodcraft woodworking. Yeah. So in the in the lathe world, uh, that whole turning thing, um, there's a big, huge like American wood turner society or something, some okay. something. I don't I don't know exactly what it is, but it's it's the one. Okay. And the, the president of that was a hand surgeon that I uh trained with nice and so he he had two no four of these gigantic one-way wood lathes they're they're huge i mean it's a big industrial piece you could put a stump on there and turn it out um nice. but anyway so he he taught me how to do some of that um but i and i wanted to get into it but i got into knives instead but he had <laughs> a, he had a real nice uh dust system like that um yeah. That's something I might do someday because um, that's a lot of fun. And yeah. turners are kind of, they're kind of like knife guys, you know, they're kind of their own own thing, you know. Yeah. One of the other things I have is a dust collector up on the, the ceiling that just okay. circulates air when I'm doing a lot of the fine stuff. Uh -huh. And it, I, I let that run for like two hours after I'm done. And that yeah. helps get a lot of the fine stuff out of the air so it doesn't uh, sit on everything. Okay. So. Yeah, because it's it's uh, that does not look like a knife shop. <laughs> <laughs> well, like our, literally all that <laughs> all that stuff <laughs> in the background would be covered with shit in about two hours. In, in, yeah. In a, yeah in a, I do a I do a uh, really conscious effort to try to keep everything clean because we we use my wife usually parks in here uh, <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm not using the knife or doing the knife stuff. So let me let me check and see if uh, anybody's. Uh, watching this yet yeah um i know they are but i just haven't uh, uh i haven't checked in on the chat or anything here i know ah. said, Murph said he's going to try to watch his post because i guess he's got to get an operation on his uh leg he had yeah post. i saw that he had a big uh big infection there um yeah. that it's not a big deal to do that unless it's it was kind of close to his joint it's the only thing yeah um Anyway, Aaron O'Neill from Kansas City says hi. Hey. Uh, he's, uh, I know him pretty well. I uh, won't say how. Uh, okay. But anyway, he's kind of new into the thing, and he's starting off kind of the way I did, where I kind of built a forge. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, eventually you kind of evolve. And, you know, my first grinder was one of those Kalamazoo uh, belt grinders, and it's a piece of garbage. And then <laughs> I very quickly uh, progressed. Um, but you know, if you if you do work that's good enough to sell, you can pay off that equipment pretty easily. So yeah. my yeah. my first batch of knives, um, which was these, I did fifteen of these. You've seen these before. The uh, yeah. Raider Boys that paid for all of my equipment. Yeah, all of it. You know, so, um, you know, you can you can break even, but there is an initial investment and you have to be sure that you really want to do it, I guess yeah. is what I would say. I, I used to work in a machine shop uh, before I moved to Chicago, uh, did a lot of work for Cummins uh, engines and mm -hmm. uh, did a lot of fabrication. So um, I when we moved to Chicago, the, the job that I have, I didn't really I uh, get to make a lot with my hands. So actually one of my, my bosses uh, or 
later became my boss. He's one of my good friends, Eric Mann. Uh, I think he might be watching. Uh, but yeah, he's uh, he got he told me about uh, Andy Roy and uh, his sub forum, and I started reading. And oh yeah, Andy at the time was doing a ton of work in progress stuff, and mm -hmm. Andy's an electrical engineer. I don't know if you knew. Yeah, I know he's got an engineering background. So uh, he said he got in there and then he didn't like it, so he started making knives and loved that. So well, and he's he's got fantastic stuff. I mean, he's he's definitely one of the top tier custom mm -hmm. knife makers um, yeah. that that makes stuff that is actually in an affordable range. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to talk about like the crazy ones, you know, that make these ridiculous things that are you know takes like three months to make, then you're into like the Jerry Fisk category. Yeah. And you know, a lot, a lot of those Walker guy. Yeah. So, so a lot of, a lot of, um, custom makers kind of play around, uh, like I do, which is I make stuff that you can actually afford, but mm -hmm. works really well. And I do it just because I enjoy it. Um, and Andy, but I know that Andy Roy and especially TM hunt, if they wanted to, they could do that Jerry Fisk style stuff. It's just, yeah. you know, it, those will literally gobble up your life, you know, doing something with that degree of, and then, you know, none of those guys do all of it themselves. You know, like if they have scrim, scrimshaw on the handle or, you know, a lot of engraving, a lot of that stuff gets sent out. Yeah. You know, so I know a guy um, that lives in, up in Mackinac city that does scrimshaw. Uh, and he says that a lot of his, uh, a lot of his work is from, you know, custom knife makers that, you know, get some piece of bone or something and you make a handle with it and he does some, you know, decorations on it. Um, but so, yeah, you know, with, and then uh, go ahead with, uh, with my job up there up in Chicago here. Um, we I didn't get to make stuff. One of the things I really enjoyed at the machine shop was every day I got to see something I was working on welding. Uh, we were just making a bunch of stuff and uh, I get to make some stuff at work, but uh, it's mainly uh, submit or making a print, submitting it to our in-house machine shop and then making it and then kind of building it up and then testing it. Uh, so Eric uh, got me, uh, got me looking at that stuff and was like, well, that doesn't need, seem like you need a ton of tools. And uh, a lot of the stuff that I wanted to have anyway, drill press is one of the first things I bought. And then, I uh, got a bandsaw, and then uh, my parents bought me the the grinder in a box kit, and started working on that, and slowly uh, buying the motor, the VFD, and uh, everything. Just uh, and now have table saw, hardness tester, and all nice. sorts of stuff now. And that happened pretty quickly because I think uh, when I last saw you, you weren't making them yet, right? I had uh, I had ground a few. Um, this was this was one of them. It's a an Akiri style. Oh uh, yeah. Actually, uh, this was the the third knife that I ground, and then uh, I didn't like how the handle came out on it, and then I uh, just threw it in the corner. And then uh, my wife goes, "Why don't you finish this one?" And then I ended up putting a bigger taper on the the front here. Yeah, yeah. Because it was this this thickness all the way down. And yeah. It didn't, didn't feel right and. Uh, so I just took it to the grinder and started grinding, and it's like, well, if it if it doesn't turn out, then uh, it's the same place. It's going to be the same place that uh, it is now. So, and uh, now that's one of the the styles that I offer. I mainly do a lot of kitchen knives. That's that's one of the things that I like a lot. That's that's a good market to be in because yeah. people will pay through the nose for those. <laughs> well, it depends. Uh, you either have people that. Uh, that really appreciate what you're doing or people that go, I can buy something like that for $50 at Walmart. It's like, yeah, but you don't care about them. <laughs> I don't care about them. I, and, and I'm one of those guys, you know, so I make knives, but my kitchen knives are, um, you know, I, my favorite kitchen knife, I bought at target, yeah. you know, and it was like a $20 knife, but it's like perfect. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've made one kitchen knife. And I patterned the blade off of that because I love it so much. Yeah. Um, it, but I made it out of uh, CPMS 30, <laughs> you know, the super high quality steel. And man, that thing was a razor. Um, yeah. but I use, I like to use uh, 154 CM. I think it gives a good balance of 
uh, cost to, to performance. And then you, you, uh, you can get it to about, I, mine are usually between 59 and 60, uh, right yeah. the, and you don't have to use diamond tooling on it to sharpen it. You can touch it up easier for, cause a lot of the people that I, uh, sell knives to aren't necessarily knife enthusiasts. So, uh, yeah. it would take them a really long time to sharpen it if I made it out of S30V or, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah something yeah well so how are you doing your heat treat i have an even heat oven yeah like me yeah okay behind it's underneath yeah i see it yep yeah i see it out of it it's the 22 and a half inch deep model yeah you have the same one that i do okay yeah yeah i like that one quite a bit uh it's got the ramp master three yep. controller so i like yep. being able to just punch in the the temperatures the, yep. that set point one you would have to hold the arrows and i was like yeah i'm gonna pay the extra 80 bucks or whatever it was yeah you have the exact uh heat treat oven that i do the exact nice. one yeah i bought mine from tim tim Zawada. okay he's a he's a dealer for that and he lives he's a uh he's one of those super high-end guys okay. um but his his thing is straight razors uh and he gets uh meteorites and nice. makes his own steel and then turns them into like straight razors and stuff. Yeah, I've heard you uh, talk about him on the, the podcast quite a bit. Well, I think he I was think on was once. One. Murph uh, was the one that ta told me about your guys' podcast. I think I was listening to it since like episode three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It's uh, it's less less frequent because Jim is uh, doesn't have a huge amount of time. And of course, neither do I. But um, what I'm trying to do is... Uh, and I always, you know, the thing about the podcast is I always enjoyed having guests on, but it's it's hard to get people to commit to that. So kind of what I'm doing now is uh, I, I'm still doing the podcast, but, you know, I like to have content more often than we're able to do it there. Yeah. You know, so it's not so this way I. It, it's not coordinating me and Jim plus some other guy, it's just me and the other guy yeah. you know uh and then i obviously i'll still do everything i do with jim it's just you you, you know how infrequent that's become <laughs> you yeah. know we, we've done yeah, like ever, four in the last year i i'd be willing to make an appearance if uh it works out yeah for sure yeah um we should do that it's uh well you've already been on it yeah yeah, yeah. i was on the, the glib yep that was, yeah I that, it, that was that that long ago yeah, we should do that sometime. Um, okay. Do that again. I, I know that uh, they're planning on uh, sometime in February going up to French Lake, okay. like the third weekend or something. Maybe I should add you to that uh, Facebook thing just in case you can go or whatever. Okay. Um, yeah, but I it's a it's I'm gonna, with the the twin boys. It's hard. Oh to, yeah. See there you go. go. See. Well, once, and that's once they get a little older. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we can do a few more trips like that. Yeah, so th that's kind of the dilemma. Um, uh, when I was living in Chicago, man, any excuse to get out of Chicago, <laughs> I was yeah. like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't actually live in in Chicago. We're in the the western suburbs in Wheaton, which is Wheaton. pretty pretty far out out of the city. So it's not. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a very back. different thing. Let me see if I can find that. Um, I I don't know that one. I of course I never really ever got to the suburbs. It's just uh, north of Naperville, if you know where that's at. Naperville is one of the the bigger, the biggest. Western yeah, I, I actually went to Naperville once because there's a um, there's a. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put up. Uh, I'll show you. This is this is the coolest technology. I love this uh, application window. There we go. So I will put it up here. Yep. Yeah, so um, so you're out of ways. See, I I lived when I lived there. I lived like right there, <laughs> okay, um, in Lincoln Park there. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I work in Melrose Park, which is uh, just a little bit east of Elmhurst. Okay, yeah. I went uh, I went up to Elmhurst once when I was a kid, but um, uh, haven't been back there since. Now in Naperville. Uh, you guys out there have uh, Lou Malnati's, yeah, which is pretty good pizza. Yeah, but it's suburb pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dig <Big> that nation. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think I think you lose your uh, 
lose the debate when you start talking to a when you start pulling a bunch of people though yeah i know i actually if you look um the style of pizza i make most often now is very similar to lou malnati's because i can't i can't buy deep dish pizza up here yeah. so i had to i had to figure out how to make it and the style that i make is almost identical to lou malnati's but i just add yellow food coloring <laughs> so yeah. it looks like gino's yeah yeah i really i really like the butter crust yeah that lou malnati's does and then then of course the sausage patty that they do and oh where it's just the whole the top of it is sausage yeah yeah, they yeah. do like a quarter inch piece of sausage, like all all over the top. And Gino's yeah. and Giordano's and a bunch of the other ones do do a similar thing. But yeah, Uno's does uh, just patties, like they you know, and plunks them down on there. It's all really good. Yeah, Malnati's. Um, I like their uh, their crust a lot. It's really good. Yeah. But uh, anyway, and of course, probably the only reason I like Gino's so much is because it was right there. You know, and it's it's the first place I ever ate that had uh, Chicago pizza. So that's the that's the first one, and so I always kind of you know yeah. took yeah, I'm off a, of I'm that. A, I'm a transplant to Chicago, so I've only been yeah. up here for that's that been eight, almost eight years now, and um, so my wife was the one that introduced me to a ton of ton of the different pizzas. So we we've tried them all, and nice. Uh, so I don't. I don't have any special allegiance to to any one of them from the get go. So yeah. So yeah, it's one of those things. So where were you at before? I I uh, lived in Columbus, Indiana, with uh, the Murph. Oh uh, yeah, that's right. That's, that's where I grew up, and my uh, I think you said on your your live stream before. My dad actually taught him in shop class when he was in seventh grade. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, that was that was pretty funny. Uh, yeah, it's uh. uh Cummins is the the main the main player there, and uh, so uh, started. I uh, worked there for a little while on their their test and development, and then uh, when I met my wife, uh, decided to move up to Chicago, and mm -hmm. uh, ended up uh, getting in with uh, Navistar. They make international trucks, semis, and school buses. So they're doing, after uh, you. testing and development for for them. They're after you. Yeah. Yeah. We live, we live near or right next to Roosevelt road. So, uh, okay. that's goes all the way into the city and yeah, uh, there's the, the central DuPage hospital is that's one of the routes they use to get to it. Okay. So it's always a lot of ambulances and stuff running up and down. Yeah. Now, uh, Murph was saying last week, uh, that there isn't an Indiana regional food. Do you agree? Uh, like, is there, so by a region, so here's, here's what I, here's what I mean, right? Um, it's a food that you ate when you were growing up that everybody else ate when they were growing up, but then you move somewhere else and nobody's ever heard of it. Uh, I don't really know of anything that nobody's ever really heard of, um, uh, other than stuff my mom just like made up. Yeah. <laughs> but, cooking in the kitchen. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, one of the. One of the things I think of is the the pork tenderloin. I know it's not uh, unique to just Southern Indiana, but yeah, uh, yeah, they pound it out real big. And there was a yep. place right next to Cummins that uh, actually did uh, uh, like quarter inch thick piece cuts, and they were smaller, but they'd put two of them on the the sandwich. And nice. the breading the breading they used for that was my favorite. When when I graduated from college, uh, the machine shop that I worked at, they actually uh, that was part of my signing bonus was to uh was five five lunches at shorties <laughs> yeah well okay so uh, uh iowa has a big connection to the pork tenderloin but i and it's like officially like their state sandwich but i think that's bs because really the the, the food that is most uniquely iowan is the made right yeah uh so sloppy joe um all of that that uh, made right is is what I would say is the Iowan version of that. Although pork they they do pork tenderloin probably goes back even further a pork tenderloin sandwich. But for me, uh, quintessential Iowa is uh, sweet corn and a made right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, those those two things are kind of what what we're known for. 
and your chili and cinnamon rolls, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's the other <laughs> thing. I have this huge – every time I make it and post pictures on Instagram or anywhere else, everybody gets all triggered, you know, <laughs> until they try it. Yeah. It is fabulous. Like, uh, you know, uh, Randy Oliver, mm -hmm. um, yeah. he uh, – he, yeah, Tradewater. He tried it and, like, loves it, is a total convert. And I've, yeah. uh, it's – it's just there's just something about it, and the the reason. Uh, so I I did some talking to uh, you know some school lunch ladies, and I'm like, well, why did you guys always pair chili with cinnamon rolls? And they're like, well, because chili is a one pot meal. You can just throw it together, and you don't have to do a whole lot of stuff. It just kind of makes itself. And then we have time to make cinnamon rolls, and we really like making cinnamon rolls, and the kids love them, so we just always serve them together. And uh, it's in Iowa, um, especially no anywhere north of I-80. Um, that was a public school staple, even in the even in the private schools, like the Catholic schools had them too. Um, the other thing they would pair them with is tacos, and it oh my God, it's good. I mean, either of those combinations, you get like a, a savory, and then you get like the sweet. And yeah, I can yeah, see how that's together. Wouldn't yeah. it have been wouldn't have been my first thought. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, then, then I got to looking into it, you know, because it's. Uh, but up in Washington State, that was a thing in the public schools up there too. Really, you know. Huh. So it's. Um, I, and I don't. I don't know how they would have discovered it. I. I think it's an Iowa thing. <laughs> our our public schools was the the rectangle pizza that was like the industrial cheese on it. Yeah, yeah, I loved that <laughs> stuff, man. That was really good. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to make the, have the a chicken chicken nuggets oh yeah we didn't we did they never made us anything like that oh we would get a uh, taco salad you know like yeah. the trump taco salad <laughs> I did, show you. did you ever have a taco in a bag uh no that was that was like later that's uh, you mean a walking taco with like doritos and taco meat yeah yeah they just throw a scoop of meat and a scoop of cheese in there and yeah so. all right uh i gotta i gotta put up an image this is like this is the funniest thing ever. I get such a kick out of this. Uh, What's going on outside? <laughs> like, this guy is so effective at triggering people. <laughs> yeah. He says, so the, he tweets this picture out on Cinco de Mayo and says, uh, 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 Trump Tower has the best taco bowls. We love Hispanics. <laughs> and everybody just lost their mind. It was like yeah. the funniest thing ever. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, like, I, I don't, I, I don't know what to think of him except that I love that he triggers people so bad. Cause I, I kind of, I'm, I'm kind of that way, you know, <laughs> I, I just couldn't believe how, uh, he could send one tweet and he couldn't buy that much television airtime. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, yeah. like, like, uh, the, his latest thing, um, uh, well, he's in big hot water right now. Um, because he said uh, something about, uh, well, is alleged to have said during the immigration meeting that, you know, they're talking about, well, you know, we need to take um, all these Haitians and, you know, they're saying, oh, and we have to give preference. And he's, he's like, why are we taking people from these shithole countries? <laughs> why don't we take people from Norway? And the entire world lost its mind. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. he could he could say one thing and everybody loses their mind. You mm -hmm. know, yeah. Uh, so if if nothing else, he's damned entertaining. Yeah. Um. But yeah, say what you want about it, but <laughs> I I don't I don't know anything about his politics, but I I love that he drives people batty. Um, he does. He, uh, he does that. <laughs> what's that? He definitely does that. Driving. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, you're an engineer type. Um, yeah. What's something I wanted to ask you? Uh, and you may, may this may not even be on your radar, uh, but uh, do you think that the United States will ever have a manned space program again? Um, I'm not. I I. I kind of don't really. I'm, I mean, other than uh, kind of doing the the SpaceX thing, that's the only one I kind of really see. I see them sending send with all the automation and stuff that they can do now. Yeah. Uh, doesn't it? 
keeps a lot of people out of harm's way, unnecessary, unnecessary risk. And uh, yeah, because Columbia blew up, and then they basically ended our manned space program. Yeah, and then, yeah, Challenger two, wasn't it? Or yeah, something like that. The Challenger was space shuttle Challenger was in the eighties, I think. Yeah. Right. It may, I might have them backwards, but one of them, I was in fifth grade and we were watching it live and it blew up. Yeah. You know, while we were watching, we're like, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, but yeah. um, uh, I know a couple people that uh, that I went to college with that were working on the uh, with uh, I think it was Northrop Grumman that were working on a moon rocket for a while. But I don't think really anything came of it. Yeah. So so here's. So here's the next question. Um, how long until I can buy C-3PO? <laughs> yeah, I'd like that too. I, I was a big well, fan of R2-D2. Yeah, well, so, so here's, here's, here's the thing, right? Um, in, the, in the early 80s, you know, this is a couple years after Star Wars came out, every kid had little robots, you know, yeah. like little remote control robots that you could program. Um, let me see if I can... Uh, Gosh, there was a there was like a little truck that had like a little dumper thing on it, and you could program it to go forward and then dump a load and then come back and you know and all this stuff. And the modern like robot director set or something? No, no. Let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, 80s robot truck toy. Um, it was. Uh, I'll see if I can find it. 80s it was like um yeah it was it was like this okay so i'll i'll put it up here um yeah i had one of these uh it's this okay and and you could you could program this thing to do all kinds of stuff and go forward and turn and do all of this stuff and the thing is is like um, modern robotics has not advanced beyond that, at least in the consumer market. Yeah, you know, and it's like, why? Like, like even the toys today, like the kids, this, this is probably just as advanced as anything that you could buy today for a kid. Yeah, you know, and that, you know, I back then, I thought that you know we would be, you know, like progressing. <laughs> yeah, we're no, supposed but, to. Have, we're supposed to have the hoverboard when like 2012 uh, or something like that. It, yeah, but like the <laughs> the 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 point is, is like, where is my goddamn C3PO? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like I I was told that there would be a C3PO. <laughs> yeah. So do you, do you see um, robotics uh, advancing to the point? Like, see, the role that I could see is, like, actually having a C-3PO, like a humanoid robot that can, like, clean your house and stuff, you know? Yeah. Or, um, you know, uh, d do tasks like that. See, there would actually be a consumer market for that. I don't think it'd be that expensive to do. Yeah. You the, know? There are some companies, I think it's Osmo, A-S-M-O. Uh-huh. Uh, they, they've been working on, uh, like, a... A robot that can walk and uh, transverse terrain and stuff. The the problem is that with all the the battery packs, is uh, they get so heavy that they have to use bigger pneumatics, which then needs more power or uh, electricity yeah. to run. And uh, so, uh, kind of so kind of gets super heavy. And yeah, it's a, it becomes yeah. unstable to try to walk and compensate and stuff. Yeah, so that's that's the let me let me show it. That's what you're talking yeah. about, right? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. It... And the, then there was another one that like uh, uh, the robots are going to use to like destroy uh, <laughs> destroy the United States when they become sentient. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, it was like. Uh, Uh, they like were uh, showing all the things that this robot could do and they like give it a box and then the guy would slam it out of his hand and then the robot would pick it back up. Or when he'd go down to pick it up, he'd like kick it over there and then he'd yeah. Walk over there. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I saw that. But it was like, man, if 
ro- when robots ever uh, uh, become like uh, was that iRobot movie? We'll see yeah, sen- sentience <laughs> or whatever. They'll like they'll be like, this is why they the, why the humans need to die. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, some uh, a gentleman named Tor says there was that Sony robot dog years ago. Oh. Yeah, it, it, so there have been some things like that um, that have come along, and and actually you may not know this, but I know it because I had one of the first Nintendos. I have uh, a Nintendo. Right, but the one of the first ones. So when it first came out, like there was some law about gaming consoles or something, and like so, in order to sell it in the United States, they had to sell it as a robot, and oh look, it comes with this gaming console. So the first Nintendos came with like a little programmable robot that was actually pretty advanced. You know, you could program it to pick up stuff and all of this. Um, But they, uh, and then sooner or later, all of that went away and it no longer came with the robot. Um, We, uh, my, uh, my old NES uh, is, is kind of, kind of on its last leg. So the, I saw on uh, Amazon, there was a, like an emulator, uh, yeah. You could actually put cartridges and stuff in. Yeah, I, I've seen that. Um, I bought the Super Nintendo one, but I'm going to change your life right now. Yeah. And you probably already know about this. That is a Raspberry Pi inside of a, a decorative case, basically. Yeah. But it's a little tiny little computer, mm-hmm. and um, you can run uh, emulators on there. So on this, I run. You can run a program called Nesticle, or there's some other ones, and then have you can download the ROMs for all your different games. Yeah. Uh, and you can. This is basically a Nintendo, Super Nintendo, any anything. But then the one that I really like is yes, I like the Nintendo stuff, but what I really like is the old arcade games that you can get. So there's yeah. a there's an emulator called Mame, and so you can play like. Uh, Spy Hunter, Double Dragon, all those old games that I love so much. Um, yeah, the, and there, I know there have been quite a few woodworkers that I kind of follow on Instagram that were making arcade cabinets and stuff using Raspberry Pi. We yeah. use a bunch of Arduino stuff at work to do some of our pneumatic controls and things. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So I, I was thinking um, someday I want to build like a little cabinet, but you'd really need to build three. You'd or at least two. You'd need to build one with a steering wheel okay. to play like the driving games like Spy Hunter and, and some of the other ones. Uh, and there's one, uh, there was like an off-road game, something. Uh, anyway, there was this off, off-road thing where you had these little stadium trucks and you could upgrade okay. them and drive them around. Hmm. Uh, and then you'd need, you'd need one with a, uh, with a trackball for some of those games that were like yeah. that. It was like that golf game, right? Yeah, like that. And then uh, this, the original Centipede had that. Um, and then there was a game called Sinistar, which was badass. I'll show you. Man, I spent so much time in... Uh, uh, I spent so much time in arcades when I was a kid. Uh, over over Christmas when we got that... When I got that uh, other one, or that new one, I played uh, Galactica a bunch. Nice. Where- the little ship and you shoot the, the little things flying around yeah yeah uh galaga you mean yeah 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 or th- th- there were different versions of it but um galaga is definitely one that i remember so this sinistar was like asteroids right really? so you'd, you'd have to play asteroids uh but then there was this thing that came this guy came out and you had to blow him up and he would like fly around and totally screw you up it was like uh, asteroids only way better I remember playing Asteroids a ton, on, mm-hmm. uh, and then Tetris too. Played yeah, t- Tetris. Tetris, yeah, that was uh, that was on uh, the original Game Boys had Tetris on it, so yeah. that's that's where people of my generation played it a lot. I joke uh, with my wife that that's how I can pack the truck as well as I do. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then there were all kinds of versions of Tetris that came out that were somewhat naughty. I'm sure you saw those, um, <laughs> but uh, I won't talk about that. Um, I don't know a whole lot about that. No, me neither. I, 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 I heard somebody, somebody told me that there were some naughty versions of it. Um, anyway, uh, 
Let's see. I what else do you know? I actually have something next to me. I don't know if you remember, but... Uh... Oh, yeah, you, you got an imp. Yeah. Which What this, number is that? That's, this is the, the misstamped imp that you gave away on Knife Journal, the number 12. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, that's yep. cool. I, I, uh, I still have uh, a couple of those around. Uh, some, some guy uh, needed some money. And asked me if I wanted to buy them back, so I bought them back. So I have, <laughs> I have the original one that uh, with the carbon fiber handle, and then yeah. I have, I have one other. I think I, I think I bought back the pink handled one. But anyway, I have those uh, in my personal collection, and I can always make more. I, I basically I just make them whenever I have eighth inch uh, scrap steel, mm -hmm. uh, and I feel motivated. But I, you know, when it's cold like this, I'm not always super motivated. Although my shop is heated, it still means I have to walk out there, turn the heat on, and then walk out again. And yeah, there's yeah, a bit of a hurdle there. Even though I have a, we have an attached garage, uh, it still gets pretty cold out here. So I have an, a, an electric heater and a, a propane heater that I yeah. uh, turn on and let it warm up a little bit. When it when it gets to be, was it 10 or something this morning? Uh, all the walls are cinder blocks, so uh, it just transfers the heat through. Nice. Through. Yeah. So what, what thickness of steel are you using on your kitchen knives? I mainly use, uh, it's 110 thousandths, uh, just a little under eighth inch. The, okay. The place yeah. I buy it from calls it 330 seconds, but it comes in at about 110. Uh, so uh, that works out really well. Uh, Where do you get your steel from? Admiral Steel. It's on the south side of Chicago, and also oh yeah, yeah, that's a good place. But do they do a do they do an internet business or is it all in yep. person? Yeah, they do uh, internet. Uh, they only have certain si or uh, certain standard sizes, um, so I have to call and order from them two inch tall uh, uh, steel because they do mm -hmm. like half inch, one inch, or they do like one inch and then one and a half inch on their website. Yeah, so I, I a lot of times for my bigger stuff we we'll use two inch, two inch steel. I'll, I'll have to look yeah. them up. I, I I know Lon that's Humphrey all, that's buys a lot all of this I stuff use there. For like my uh, my chef's knife and stuff, it's two about two inches. Uh, yeah, the top part here. Nice. And then uh, do the the santukus. Yep. So very nice. I really like that handle combo with the the brown, white, and blue. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, the natural pins. I don't know how well that's showing up on the. Yeah, it's showing up good. Yeah, that's a blue G10 there. Yeah, that one. Uh, when I was at Blade two years ago, uh, Ethan actually handled it. It was the first time I ever met him, and he said that that was uh, that's his favorite style of kitchen knife. Yeah, that's the that's the basically the style that I uh, that I like too. Um, yeah. And my, if you saw my kitchen knife, you'd laugh. I mean, it's just garbage, but it's, it performs so well, you know, and then I, I take it out and, uh, you know, I can sharpen it to, yeah. you know, I really like sharp. The, San, the Santoku. Uh, yeah. That's actually uh, one of the things I did this morning. I posted oh, it on yeah. Instagram uh, just to, right before we started, but I got an electro etch. And those oh, are okay. the first two marks. How do, uh, you, uh, how do you do that? Explain that process to me. So uh, it, you have a stencil. I grab, grab, have it right here. So you have to, you get these things printed. So it's similar to screen printing for a t-shirt. Yeah. So this is a photo sensitive uh, uh, material in a really fine mesh screen. And then they print out uh, IMG. Uh, it's like inter, intercontinental marking group or something. They're out of Utica, New York. It was who made my stencils and who made the unit that I have. Um, they, uh, so they print out on a clear piece of plastic, uh, uh, a black mark, and then they put the photosensitive material yeah. on, uh, on top of it, and then they expose it to ultraviolet light, and then that's the the blue all hardens. I'm going to show you and something they... real quick. Uh, let me see. Hopefully, it'll show up here. Uh, it's not showing up. You're showing up. Just a second. I'll turn this. There we go. Uh, I mainly just see my reflection in there. Oh, uh, yeah. Let me turn it yeah. a little bit. You see that? Yeah. 
I, I actually screen print uh, posters and stuff. Cool. Yeah, it's a similar so, process, and then you, uh, oh, now you're on the Enterprise. Yeah, I had, awesome, to, I had to change uh, <laughs> change and go to my spaceship. <laughs> Since we were talking about robots and stuff, and my deep disappointment with the fact that I don't have a C-3PO yet. <laughs> um, but, you know, okay, so I have a crazy theory. Um, do you want to know, so I think this is true, but do you, do you want to know why we're able to do what we're doing right now over the internet? Uh, what probably, drove what drove the, the, what drove high speed internet was the the pornography industry. Yeah, exactly, porn. <laughs> so I think I think that the first highly functional and awesome robots are going to be like porn bots. Probably. And I and, well, and they're working. Actually, that's where all of the development is right now. Hmm. Um, but I, I want, I don't want that. I want like uh, yeah. somebody that can like, you can know, clean up this mess, knives or uh, clean your house or something. Yeah, yeah, or, or like you know, <laughs> chop up this stuff for me, you know, so I don't have to do it, you know, yeah. or go yeah. light a fire, <laughs> you know. So yeah, the with the 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 marking, then you have a you have a big uh, machine or have a machine. That has a bunch of relays and a big, uh, uh, like, black box in there. And then you have a marker <clears throat> that you, uh, so you put this down, you tape, you put the stencil down, you tape it, and then uh, you use it what they call an electrolyte, which they have all sorts of different salt, salt, yeah. and blends for uh -huh. whatever material they're marking. And then uh, you get the pad wet, and then uh, you with DC is, uh, what goes deep so the top one that i did is is a lot deeper you can feel it uh okay. when you drag your fingernail across it and then the the bottom one is a lot more smooth uh and that's on ac power so the dc pulls the metal out and then the ac goes back and forth and darkens the mark oh cool and then obviously the deeper one would be a lot more long lasting yeah, yeah it's a lot more like a stamp yeah but and um i was looking at getting the cost for a stamp and 300 uh, bucks. I wanted to have uh, a few different things. Cause I, on my, my sheet of uh, stencil, I have uh, my logo a few times, my name, a few different ways and different sizes, and then uh, a whole number set. So I can, at, cause I've started serializing a bunch of my knives now. So like this is number 75 oh, yeah. uh, and Murph, uh, he got, the I think the last one I'm ever gonna st have stamped, which is number 101. Nice, so, uh, pretty clean break. Uh, yeah. So this is yeah, I've, one, number I've 100, been... which is uh, a big uh, 10 inch carving knife that I finished just right before Christmas, and has one of the nice. my favorite pieces of wood. Uh, it's called shock wood, uh, okay. made by Beyond Wood Products, and he gets all these crazy burls, and there's cracks and. Uh, how the wood goes across and fills in with the different resin colors and stuff. Uh, yeah. I think it's super cool. Yeah, that's neat. I've seen that stuff before. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about doing the electroplating thing. I just haven't bit the bullet, but my one stamp is starting to wear out. <laughs> yeah, that's that's and, one of the things that I was I was like, I can get a stamp, be like 300 bucks. Uh, I ended up going a lot. I found a unit, a used unit on eBay uh, made by that same IMG place that is a lot higher power and also has a timer in it. So you can hit the foot switch and then it'll mm -hmm. go for however, up to 30 seconds. Uh, so you can get more consistent because uh, trying to do the, the serialized numbers, I want them all to be the same kind of uh, depth down. So instead of trying to count it out in my head, I can just hit the pedal and then it, uh, does it for the exact amount of time and then stops. Hmm. Oops. So. Um, I did something wrong. Uh, uh, let's see. I, I got to moderate our chat a little bit. <laughs> there we go. There's somebody being naughty on there. <laughs> uh, there we go. Uh, Tor says that handle looks great. Tor, sorry, I accidentally, um, I accidentally, uh, accidentally deleted you. Um, 
thanks, Tor, <laughs> for the compliment. And uh, anyway, uh, let's see. I'm going to... There we go. Every every once in a while, you'll get a um, get a uh, a troll or whatever. I don't care. Whatever. Yeah. I I, I, recently, I like it actually. <laughs> I recently just uh, kind of put a little more effort in uh, some of my YouTube stuff. I made a, a couple of videos on uh, a box I made for some of my sanding paper, and then I also made a couple boxes to hold my uh, my grinding belts. Uh, you oh, might cool. actually be pretty interested in that. We got it, yeah, and we got to get your YouTube channel too. Put that up. So. Oh yeah, that's nice. Here's the the box, and then all the belts just kind of sit in there, and then you can pull the whole, uh, just lift the whole pile of them out, pull one out, and then slide it back in. Uh, so I don't have them all in plastic bundles and hanging on hooks and stuff all over the all over the shop. So yeah, I, I I need one of those. <laughs> I've I've been uh, been asked by a couple people to to make them. Like, uh. <laughs> yeah, I know it's it's one of those things. Once you, um, so what's your YouTube channel? It's just a uh, real simple cage daily, and then the space, and then knives. Okay, sweet. I'll have to check that out. And then, uh, on Instagram, it's cage daily knives, and uh, on I have a Facebook page, cage daily knives, and. On blade forms, I'm just cage daily. Uh, had that before I started making knives, so uh, cool. But pretty, pretty consistent. Nice. Uh, okay, what are you running for a, uh, a bandsaw? Uh, it's just a 10 inch Craftsman cheap one uh, that I, I have I, mounted to a Harbor Freight I, base. I had I had that, and I can't cut metal with mine. Yeah, so when I, I, I just use that for handle material. Uh, yeah, so okay. For, for steel, I use uh, a porta band from Milwaukee with a, a swag base. It's the, the company that makes it. But the, they're the, the portable, uh, it's one of those portable band saws. Oh, uh, yeah. Trigger. And then I mounted it to a couple of two by sixes which I've okay. done on a few things and then have a foot pedal switch so I can press it on and off mm -hmm. uh, to turn it, turn it on and off. And uh, yeah, an older blade that was around the top here, okay. but uh, that's, that's what I use. And on the side here, it has a, uh, a variable speed knob that you can adjust up and down, but mainly I just have it on the, the slowest setting. Okay. Yeah, the, actually finding a, a bandsaw that'll cut metal is kind of a pain in the ass. So, it's a, the company's name is Swag. Okay. Off-road. They actually do it for a lot of the Jeep guys was, okay. uh, who started making it. And then a lot of the knife makers ended up uh, doing it. You, the only problem is that it, you can only do uh, five inches deep because that's the throat. Because it's uh, – unless you uh, – it depends on how you're cutting. I'll show you a better view straight on. So. Oh yeah, because it's it's only it's kind of far yeah. off of the. Yeah, I see. Yeah, so the the depth here is like five inches. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, but I mean, um, I see. I see. So it's not like a, a regular bandsaw, like where uh, the blade is uh, all the way off to one side. Yeah. So where you okay. can just put through however long a piece it'll it'll hit the the other side of the yeah band. Yeah. But it works it works well. I mainly uh uh buy buy a lot of my steel and strips and then kind of rough get it chop off a few pieces so if there's like a, a square or something. Yeah. Uh, I kinda cut it off, but I know a lot of like Andy, he just takes it to the thirty-six grip belt and just he uh, hogs it lets off. Let's it go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I what I do um, is I do uh, I have a angle grinder. Mm -hmm. I'll put it in a vise and use an angle grinder for stuff like that. But and that's what I did before I had the the porta band. Yeah, that's nice. That's a good idea. Yeah, and it's not not too terribly expensive. Uh, the Milwaukee one that I got uh, mm -hmm. went on sale, and then the 
I think the table, I'm not exactly sure. Hmm. Uh, I, th I don't think the table was too terribly expensive. Hmm. Yeah, like 100, 130 bucks. Yeah, that's, that's not bad when you start talking about tools that actually work. Yeah, for for metal ones, uh, that, and I mean you could you could use the the porta band, uh, just clamping it in a vise and then uh, cutting it too. So, yeah, sweet. I like that you can take it take it in and out of that table fairly easily too. If I ever need yeah. to cut something else, mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh slowly slowly building up some of the different stuff. Currently, I'm on a on a carbon fiber kick. I haven't actually made a bunch of knives, but uh, there's a guy on Instagram, AJ Composites, who makes uh -huh. this, uh, or has this for he calls it a forged carbon fiber. Okay, uh, looks super cool. Uh, and then I got some some twill. Oh yeah, new, uh, nice. carbon fiber. Uh, so bought uh, bought a few quite a few pieces of carbon fiber, and then uh, uh, Mr. T M Hunt is. Uh, making one out of some carbon fiber that i bought uh he uh he was uh texting me one night and uh he had been drinking and i was still uh fully uh fully awake and he uh <laughs> he offered to trade a uh a kitchen knife for a m18 because he, oh. he, he hates making uh kitchen knives and his wife had been after him gina and, yeah uh so i said you know this is all a record he goes I may be uh, slightly intoxicated, but I know what I'm saying. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll I ended see. up making him an eight-inch chef's knife and a, uh, a boning knife uh, nice. in trade. I got to find something here. Um, give me a second. It's in here. Here it is. Uh. So I have uh, number six. Yeah. I actually got to play with that one when you brought it to Glib. Yep. Um, so I have, uh, I actually, I didn't order one, but he, he came to uh, Becker's thing. Uh, and it was right after he, I think he first started making knives. He wasn't even full time yet. And he had that. It was the sixth one he made. And this is back when they were putting just the standard Becker handles on it. Yeah. And, that and uh, the, the douche hole on it, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me see. I, I, Alan, I don't. Alan Holm. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Douchehole. <laughs> well, anyway, um, so uh, uh, let's see. And then I actually somewhere still have the Kydex sheath that he made, that nice. came with it. But I, I made my own because I, um, I don't know. I I had some different requirements, but. Um, I think yeah, that's so, one of the one of the next uh, pieces of equipment uh, slash capabilities that I want to do for the knife shop is to offer a Kydex sheath with some of the kitchen knives. Yeah, it, well, it's um, it's easy to do. You just uh, Jant Supply has a a press, mm -hmm. a platen press uh, with some foam stuff, and then you just buy like the rivets and and the little rivet tool yeah. from them and uh, you can get set up in that for like I don't know under a hundred bucks and then you just you just uh, you know cut your kydex out uh, put your knife in between the two sheets uh, but and then press it but I I heat the sheets up in the oven at 315 and then right. and then you put them in and pop and it, it uh, and then you drill the holes and stuff after I mean it's it's really not a difficult thing to do I've heard I've heard it doesn't it doesn't take a take a ton of effort, but just never uh, never got around to buying all the stuff and <laughs> doing yeah it. yeah it's easy to do it's um um it's easy mode not like making leather sheaths those are yeah that takes talent that's one of the one of the reasons why I like uh, doing uh, kitchen knives you don't have to make a sheath. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I do a, do a lot of my own leather stuff, and what I carry every day is I call it the pocket bush crafter. Nice. Uh, it's a little three inch blade with a like a three and a half inch handle. Uh, oh, nice. 
the medical industry. I actually got to use this to trim the cords on the, the boys when they were born. Oh, nice. Uh, the nurse was, uh, uh, she was like, you want to do what? I'm like, yeah, I make my own knives. And she goes, that's really neat. <laughs> <laughs> so I do the, do the leather and uh, I, this is what I call the, the back pocket. So uh, cool. You know, yeah. Being in Chicago, not having something hanging from your belt that everybody can see is uh, kind of, yeah, you can't, can't really do that. <laughs> yeah. So I just, it fits in the back pocket, sort of like a wallet and uh, yeah, helps even out uh, for my, the wallet on my other side. Nice. Yeah. I, I can't carry a wallet anymore because the seats in my car, uh, I was like getting, yeah, I was like getting a sore leg. And I'm like, God, what is this? You know, and then I figured out it's because the wallet sits funny in the seat and it was like yeah. causing issues. So I, I don't. So have, you go like a card sleeve or something or. Uh, you, it varies. I, I sometimes I carry a, a wallet, but I'll carry it in a in a in like a coat pocket or something. Um, but when it's not uh, coat weather, um, I have let's see if I can find it. I can't find it, but anyway, it was a, a Kickstarter project, which was just a little metal foldable Clam card. Chocolate. Yeah. And uh, so when it's, and then I just take that and just throw it in the car or whatever. Yeah. A lot of uh, people up here don't carry any cash on them whatsoever. So they, a lot of them go with like a little sleeve that holds like six or seven cards. Yeah. And that's all I do. Cause I, I don't carry any, any ca I can't remember the last time I had cash in my wallet. I, like, I'm still a con or a, a holdout, I guess. I, I still like to have some on me. Yeah, I probably should, but <laughs> I don't know. So uh, what else? What else is new? Anything else? Uh, the the new year. I'm looking uh, looking forward to what uh, what happens in the new year, and uh, one of the big things for the for my little side hobby business uh, is uh, I'm going to have a table at Blade uh, this oh, year. Oh, awesome. So, uh, yeah, I'll be down there June 1st through 3rd and uh, try to have, uh, hopefully have 30 to 35 knives to, to take. So I'm, I'm getting started on those now. Yeah. I, I was wondering why you're keeping so much stock around. <laughs> well, the, the ones that are on here are the ones that I actually, uh, actually pulled out of my knife block these this is actually uh oh, okay. my wife's and, okay uh, yeah those are a lot of the knives that we use uh every day yeah uh, some of the some of the ones without handles are ones that aren't spoken for yet that will hopefully be going into the the stock yeah or, uh, yeah so that's that's my issue that's why i've never had a, a knife table at blade is if i make something it's gone like yeah I, if somebody finds out that I have something like it's gone, yeah, you know I they they, they will just get them to to this point where they're like finished ground. Um, yeah, and somebody somebody ends up saying I need a a present ASAP or something end up uh, selling it off. So yeah, so it's hard it's, to say no when people keep. Uh, yeah, they face. you know I I, I made <laughs> this this stupid knife out of a lawnmower blade, uh, and it's back. When I was playing around with the, uh, um, gosh, I don't even remember what, the Hamon lines. It's back yeah. when I was playing around with that. Well, I took a lawnmower blade and got a Hamon line on it. Nice. And it was like beautiful. I made this little little parangue that I was going to keep for myself. And I posted a picture and this guy's like, I have to have that. And I'm like, you can't have it. <laughs> and he's like, uh, and he's like, no, I have to have it. I'll pay anything for it. And I said, oh, yeah, right. Make me an offer. And he named this outrageous amount of money. I'm like, okay, <laughs> here's my PayPal. I'll, it'll be in the mail tomorrow. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's, so, uh, yeah. A lot of the, a lot of the knives that I've made have uh, been to, to friends and people that I like went to high school with uh, that have contacted me through, that have found me again through Instagram or my website. And uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, seeing, see, getting to, Get to see your knives in use. Occasionally, they'll they'll send me photos of them chopping stuff up on the kitchen board. And I like yeah, like seeing them being used. That's fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. My wife and I we like to to cook a lot. I like to grill more, uh, uh -huh. and uh, so we use our knives literally every day. Cool. 
So I got this uh, friend. Um, he was uh, from Chicago. Uh, he's uh, lived in a suburb, grew up there, and then went to the University of Iowa with me. And now he lives, uh, I think, Fort Wayne or someplace like that in Indiana. Yep. Uh, but anyway, they're, they came up this weekend and they're skiing at Boyne. And tonight they're going to come over. And uh, I'm making my, you know, if you're going to have a bunch of people over and you don't, you don't want to deal with dietary concerns and all this crap, it, it's my go-to thing. And you've had it, just a big pot of spaghetti and meatballs. Yeah. It, like you literally can't go wrong, you know, because yeah. literally everybody will eat that. And if they don't want the meat, then they just take it out, you know. Mm. Uh, but I'm, I'm doing that tonight. Uh, I also, uh, you probably have Costco by you, right? Yep. Okay, so the, the, the most underrated thing in the world is Costco meat. Yeah. Uh, so if you go to the if you go to the store, even to buy like a, a USDA choice uh, strip steak, you know the whatever or any ungraded strip steak, you're going to pay bare minimum ten to fourteen dollars for one steak, right? You can go to Costco and get USDA Prime an entire strip loin and get uh, like this big, literally screen to screen big. Uh, and get, you know, 15 to 20 big prime steaks out of that for a hundred bucks. Yeah. You know, it's the, it's the dumbest thing to buy individual steaks and pay all this money for it. What I do is I, I buy it then I, I chop it into my steaks and then I take them and, um, you know, for a big dinner party, I'll just eat it all then. But usually what I do is I take an individually, um, do them in the food saver. Yeah. You know, and that's they're what perfect. Too. They're, what's that? That's what we do too. Uh, yeah, my, uh, I really like ribeye, and my wife really likes uh, New York strip. So yeah. we'll, uh, we'll food saver uh, a strip and uh, a ribeye together, and buy a big buy a big pack of them. Yeah, yeah. So that's you know the but buying it in bulk is is the way to go. And and uh, when I lived in Iowa, we had a Costco by one of my offices in Des Moines, and uh, you know, I could get it there. Um, and then I came up here and there wasn't a Costco. Well, we just got a Costco in. Nice. So, yeah. So I went there and renewed my membership and, uh, now I'm, uh, uh, then I of course went and got a bunch of, got a whole strip. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going to, you know, well, tonight we get USDA prime, uh, New York strip. Of course, my favorite is a bone and ribeye. Yeah. That's um, my that's my favorite. Yeah, but to to so in order to do that and do it in bulk, you know, you could buy like a whole big huge bone in rib thing. The mm. problem is is you'd have to have some sort of a saw to saw those bones and I think they yeah. use like a bandsaw or something yeah, for that. Yeah, like stainless steel bandsaw. Lots of or uh, Costco if you uh or at least the one by us, uh if you want one of the the big roasts, they'll actually uh cut it up for you and just put the pack or put the the price from the the one that wasn't cut up on the on there so they don't charge yeah. you for cutting it up there. i i think yeah i think they can do that i think what i might do is uh when i eat up all these ones i'll go in there and see if they have a big uh uh bone in and then get them to slice it into bone in ribeyes because that's the yeah. that's a great cut of meat the other great cut of meat is a t-bone mm -hmm. Oh God, I love T-bones because they got that tang to them. You know, they're a little bit tangier. They taste different than, than yeah. other meats. But yeah, the uh, the one by us, the, you just tell them, yeah, I want them cut like inch and a quarter, and he'll just slice it all up until he gets to the end. Nice and sweet. Well, I got nothing else here. Uh, you so you aren't working on any knives? Uh, I yeah, I am. I'm actually we were talking about uh, doing something for Murph, but I didn't get to. I, I, listen yeah, I, I am. Uh, that's that's the one. Uh, but uh, I'm still kind of mulling around and thinking of ideas. I'm, I'm kind of trying to figure out how I'm going to do the handle. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to do it with a antler pommel. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm thinking about what I want to do proximal to that so towards the blade from the pommel i'm kind of mulling some things out and i haven't made a decision what yet a, 
one of the things I like a lot is the the like uh, this bias cut micarta. So it's micarta. This is actually Westinghouse stuff from way back when. That yeah. This is two inches tall. Yeah, you probably got that from Joe Flowers. Okay. Did you? Uh, no, no, I got. Oh, okay. This. There's a there's a knife show uh, up in Wisconsin called the Badger Knife Show. Okay. And there's a guy that that bought like an entire uh, storage unit full of of uh, miscellaneous tools and stuff. Yeah. And in, in the back of it was like a thousand pounds of uh, brown micarta. So, yeah. So I I bought a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of blocks like that from. Uh, Joe Flowers. So I've got a bunch of that. That's really nice stuff. Yeah, it and finishes that, out really well too. Yeah, it's it's um it's like a natural looking micarta, but I think that some of that stuff came from when they used to make transformers with those. Yeah, they used to use yeah. it for electrical insulators. Yeah, for the big yeah, huge, like you know, the, the transformers and stuff. Yeah. So I yeah, think there's yeah. a lot of that stuff around. When I make some of that or with that bias cut stuff, I get People argue with me that it's not wood. I'm like, look, I cut it up. Well, you're gonna argue with me? I like actually. <laughs> yeah. It's not wood. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Well then, uh, nice what else? Got? Was, uh, fun talking with you. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I I like to talk about knives, but I also like to talk about other stuff. You know. <laughs> yeah. I'm that's always up like. for talking about Star Wars. You seen the the most recent one yet? No. That's that's, I, that's one that'll get you controversial. Oh, I'm scared off of it. I I don't want to see it. I I heard they killed Luke Skywalker, and I don't know. I just I'm like, hmm, yeah, no. Um, yeah, they, they did a little bit of Hollywood interjecting their politics into the the movie. Yeah, so I'm not going to give them my money. Well, they and this this whole uh, this uh, this movie, like all the old ones, were uh, even like one, two, and three were like multiple days, like multiple months. And uh, this one is like one day. Huh. The, the whole thing happened is or supposedly happens all in like one or two days. Yeah, I I just I got scared off from it. I was going to go see it, but then everybody's telling me there's all this SJW shit in there, and I'm like, mm, yeah, no thanks. <laughs> I'm not I'm not paying for that. Yeah. Uh, the I did see an awesome movie, Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Okay, I've heard that was a good one. Oh God, it was fantastic! I saw it in an IMAX, and I just loved it. Actually, in five days, it comes out on uh, DVD. I have it pre-ordered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I'll, I'll try to catch that one on uh, on Netflix. I didn't get to get around to seeing uh, Guardians of the Galaxy two, but I've heard quite a few people liked like that one pretty well too. I didn't see Guardians of the Galaxy one. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the, a lot of my coworkers are uh, big comic book. Fiend, so okay uh, they talk about it all the time yeah I'd, I'd have to see it i i didn't i, I haven't followed at many of those kinds of movies i occasionally i'll see a batman yeah. you know those are really the only kinds of movies like got, that got a batman yeah shirt on. <laughs> nice yeah so i'll occasionally i'll watch one of those i like the superman ones that come out usually uh, especially the original one with christopher reeves okay yeah that was awesome yeah. Um, yeah. uh, and it had, uh, Christopher Reeves and Gene Hackman. Uh, you know, Gene Hackman is a, he was in all kinds of stuff, just a great actor. Um, anyway, and he was in that original Superman. It was awesome. He played Lex Luthor. Yeah. I never really got much into the Supermans. I like the Batmans quite a bit, even though yeah. the, there was the, the Jim Carrey, uh, super, uh, stylized ones there for a while but the 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 recent ones they did were i think pretty good yeah i saw one recently that was pretty good too i um like the dark knight or something like that yeah, yeah. i like that one uh, I like batman because he doesn't have any superpowers other than just having a, lo a ton of cash <laughs> yeah a lot of money yeah so um so somebody told me once and, and then we should probably go uh somebody told me that the U.S. sees itself as Superman. Everybody else in the world sees us as Batman. <laughs> I, I could do, I could get behind that analogy. Yeah, um, it's it's pretty pretty accurate. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, good talking to you. Thanks yeah. for coming on and tell your buddies that are 
in the knife world if they want to just come on and shoot the breeze for a little bit happy to have them yeah yeah, yeah you you know quite a few of the same people i do so yeah i know uh, <laughs> the, the deal is though it's like you offer somebody to come on and they get nervous you know like a lot of people just are nervous about you know being on the internet or whatever and i i understand that but you know you, I got you know if stuff on there now i'm kind of past the point of no return yeah me too and the thing is is like um uh if you had your credit checked by equifax so like if you bought a house if you mm -hmm. applied for a credit card bought a car guess what everybody yeah. fucking knows everything about you fam <laughs> sorry yeah <laughs> I just, so. I just wanted to make sure that I had all the right uh, stuff and even had to download something right before we got on. So, Yeah, it's it's no big deal. So now you know it's easy. Yep. Well, if you ever yeah. want me on again. Uh, yeah, for sure. Work. Yep. I, I think um, on Tuesday night, I'm working on getting Anthony Scalambrini on. Nice. I've never uh, actually seen a picture of what he even looks like. <laughs> I've heard yeah, I don't... to him a ton on Gear Geeks Live. But... Yeah, so I, I'm going to have him on and... Uh, shoot the breeze with them a bit um i thought it was cool when they would go through some of the the bench made and spider co catalogs and yeah i used to love uh, that dan and uh andrew yeah and then yeah and then they yeah i used to i used to love love it when they do that they'd get a copy of it in advance and then the cr the crazy thing about them is, is they've got all these connections to like big people like at mm -hmm. these big knife manufacturing places yeah. And I, I always thought that was cool. Like they'd have people on from like actual, you know, and you'd actually get to hear what they were thinking and stuff. Pretty recently, and, or Anthony had uh, the Michael Walker on and uh, he was talking a little bit about the zipper blade and stuff. I, I find that thing crazy how he, he said he works on the, just the blade for like a month before it, it, he even knows if it actually is going to work or not when he, forge welds it what's the zipper blade so he actually like takes like a piece of titanium or something on the top and then carves mm -hmm. like all these little like he does different patterns in there uh some are like saw teeth and then he has a piece of blade steel that he he makes a a, a perfect matching part and then puts it together and like forge, forge welds it or somehow gets it to stick so that the edge is actual blade steel and the, the back is uh, something that he can like heat anodize or very uh, cool yeah that's you neat pulled up there no i I'll, I'll look it up here right. i was just i was just listening to your description yeah he, uh, he had one some that looked like a little keyhole and some that kind of look like saw teeth and uh yeah it calls it a zipper blade because it fits, fits yeah out. yeah I, I i've seen it before i uh and it's his name is uh what's his name again Michael Walker. You yeah, I, 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 yeah, I see it. Okay, yeah, I've seen these before. I'll, I'll put it up on the stream here so people can see it. But it's like, I think he said he, he does like two or three months per knife. Yeah. Uh, just one. <laughs> and on, a, on the thing, he was like, I, I can't even afford a Michael Walker knife. Yeah, so that's, now you see how he did the, hand, he did the handle there? Mm -hmm. where it's machined like that and then uh i've seen some yeah. guys starting to do that with my carta and that's a pretty neat sure. look yeah kind um of sure action there there's a there's a really cool uh guy uh, uh matt christensen he's on the the south side of chicago um uh, he uh he has ck knife works and he makes a ton of like tactical flippers and stuff and he was the one that uh uh, helped show me uh, my folding knife that I've been working on and haven't haven't done anything with for since the boys were born. Yeah, I'm I, I haven't I haven't done anything with folders, but someday I'm going to buy a, a mill. Yeah, and and do that. You know, the 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 kind of mill to get I think for knife making, the way to find that is to go to these forums where they talk about you know. Uh, you, you can buy like a piece of steel and a jig and basically make an AR receiver. Yeah. Those forums where they talk about that, those would be perfect little um, manual mills for your for uh, event. Grizzly, you know? Grizzly makes one that uh, is what Matt has, but this is the the uh, the folder that I was working oh, on. Oh, very, very so cool. It's 
got a flipper tab frame lock. Uh, it doesn't actually lock, uh, but uh, flips pretty well. I've made it out of CPM D2, one nice. of from my other steels that I like. But uh, yeah, it doesn't lock yet. And, but sounds uh, sounds pretty cool. Titanium uh -huh. handles. Uh, Very neat. Yeah. So how'd you do the? How'd you do all the work on the? Do you have a mill or you? You worked with uh, him. Yeah. On it? So I went to Matt's pl pay place and brought a brought a pack of he wanted some root beer uh so i got the goose island root beer and uh gave him some some bucks and on a saturday stayed out there for four or five hours and he helped me helped show me how to put in like the detent and uh some of the stop pin stuff and so we we worked on making the the scales so very cool and apparently he heating up this little area for the to get it to bend in uh, is one of the critical things to do so yeah that, but, yeah because then it's got a yeah anyway folders are a pain in the ass <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it took a long time to where it's at and never got around to cutting the lock or making it out there again to cut the lock and stuff so uh, uh -huh. with the with the boys and stuff when uh when i'm not there courtney my wife has to has to deal with it all herself and when she's not there i need to deal with it all myself so it's a lot a lot harder to kind of or don't want to ask her to have to deal with all that for a day and while i go have fun so okay yeah i understand so. <laughs> <laughs> i i've i've been there so. yep all right man good having yep. you on yep talk to you later yep bye